I can remember Johannes sitting across from me on that Sunday night right after the Hackers on Planet Earth conference last year. And he said he was going to give me details about a project he wanted me involved in. He started to explain that it was a movie in Austria and I'd be playing a part and he needed me in three weeks. And I said, no more information needed. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who are helping me get out of debt. Now, Johannes is a whole thing in himself. His name is Johannes Gerzferner. He works for a group called Monochrome, which is a nonprofit art and disruptive group out of Austria. And for over 20 years, Monochrome has been messing with people's minds. They've made website projects, museum projects, held events, conferences. To go into them in any detail would take up at least a couple episodes. But suffice to say that Johannes is one of those people who wakes up in the morning very early and then gets started on a whole range of projects, making them not just well-planned, but well-executed, in concert with the other members of Monochrome, of course. Over the years, I found myself wrapped into some of his projects. I'd been flown to Austria before for a large technology event that he put on. I had attended a sex and technology conference in San Francisco, and I'd been to a whole bunch of talks of his given all over the eastern seaboard, and which he would dress in weird outfits and put himself on stage in character and cause all sorts of messes. It was always a delight. Somewhere in the last few years, Johannes started going after the big creative fish. That is, he started to get into making feature films. As somebody who makes films himself, I have a lot of opinions on how to make a film and how to film things and what sort of things a documentary or narrative would involve. But here was an opportunity handed to me in a restaurant after a hacker con to be in one. And just as an actor, without one little bit of organization needed on my part. This was going to be a new and wonderful experience, but this wasn't the reason I said yes. I said yes because I'd follow Johannes anywhere. A few years before, he had come out with a low-budget science fiction dystopian picture called Der Gettenschaga, and I apologize ahead of time for my terrible German. And it was a post-apocalyptic journey film about two journalists who were assigned to speak to the head of a cult where they would get the story out. And along the way, they encounter all sorts of strange creatures, strange people, and eventually meet the person they're looking for, only to have all of their expectations turned on their head. I've seen this film a couple times, and you can see it online, but there was one scene that really affected me, and it's a weird one. In a bunch of post-apocalyptic journey films where everything is weird and off-kilter and our hero is trying to get somewhere, there's usually a low point. It's easy to film, so they tend to do it. It's where the hero finds themselves without the thing they need, without the direction they have to have, without the machinery they're using, and they have to, in some way, get it back they usually encounter some sort of weird cult, some sort of unusual group, see them do something disturbing, and then, in some move, get them to give the stuff back, and the journey continues. So in Daigetenshaga, they encounter a group of cultists who worship electricity and appliances, and they actually break into a pretty complicated song and dance number while dressed up in Christmas lights, singing about the glory of electricity. The leader of the cultists is a hundred percent into this character, totally, utterly invested, and he is strange and weird and glittery and glowing. He is going to give the performance of his life. I thought to myself, you know, as someone who loves films and actually really loves low-budget films, I would love that opportunity. 
just to be given something, something that I do, and I play it to the hilt. I resolved at that moment, if there was anything Johannes ever needed me for one of his films in the future, I'd be there. Johannes does have his own white whale. There's a film he's been wanting to make. It's a historical musical. I really can't give too many details about it because I don't know when or where he's going to work on it. But it's been a whole process of trying to get budgeting and investors and grants and put it all together and, and make this film. And he gave me a part in it. I've looked at the part. It's a pretty good part. But the years have gone on and it's been difficult. This isn't out of the ordinary, by the way. I mean, Mad Max Fury Road took well over a decade to get made, and that was somebody who had proven himself over the years with the work he's done. Johannes just has to keep plugging away at it. Johannes is not the kind of guy who's just going to sit around and wait for opportunity. So he's made a number of films since then, including a documentary about traveling around the United States, meeting geeks and hackers and technical people called Trace Route. And he also made a strange, fun pastiche about politics, technology, and freedom called Glossary of Broken Dreams. I made an appearance in that film, but it mostly involved me reading a five-page script inside of a studio in my hometown and then sending him the wave files. But here he wanted me, in the flesh, acting like somebody else. And I had told him, whatever it was, I was going to do it. So I'm really not in a position to give you any plot details. The name of the film is called Je suis Otto, and it's a German language and English language sci-fi film that makes commentary on our interactions with machines, politics, and, of course, each other. And it stars a talking car. I'm one of the passengers, a gangster who's going from one place to another, and things don't go as planned. I'll leave it at that. The car is played by Chase Masterson, who was a Star Trek actress and has done a whole bunch of other work and is a very good singer. So I was mailed the script by Johannes and I started reading it over and it's natural when you're an actor to find out how many pages do you have? Are you there at the end? Are you mentioned in these scenes? What do you have to say? How many days am I going to have to be on set? The booking that Johannes made for me in Austria would put me in there for five days. Of those five days, three of them would be shooting days. Each of the scenes is given a number, just something like 5, 15, 25, and then a simple title like exterior day, parking lot, restaurant. And you know, as an actor, which scenes you're in. Scenes 2, 5, 7, 23. That's no indication of when you'll be filming it, where you'll be filming it, or how you'll be filming it. When you're working with a director, somebody who's in charge, they have a vision of what their film is going to be, and you, as an actor, can play various amounts of involvement in the planning and execution. I mean, obviously you're reading the lines, but how much more than that you want to do, well, that just depends on your style. One of the things that I first came back to Johannes with after reading was asking, should I shave my head? The reason why was because this was a tough-talking character, and I know that when I had shaved my head in the past, people had said it made me look like an entirely different person. And Johannes couldn't believe I would do that. With some actors, there's an obvious pay differential to make them change their hairstyle radically, but I was totally for it. He said okay, and I shaved my head freaking out a lot of people in my life. I purchased an inexpensive suit, which they expensed, and ended up buying three of them because at some point my character would have to end up on the ground and I thought it would be better just to have a couple suits in reserve. After that, it was just a matter of reading and rereading the part. At one point, I offered to rewrite one of the paragraphs of what I was saying just because it had some strange constructions of the sentences and I thought it could be a little bit better. I wrote it, they agreed, and that became my new lines. A week or two later, I was on my way to Austria, ready for fun. Either you know how films are made or you don't. I'm just going to talk about some of the things that people may not expect. Most films, 
the vast, vast majority, are not filmed sequentially. If you see a character in a deli, and then later they go all through the country, and then they end up back in the deli, they probably shot both deli scenes in the same day, even having to redo how people's hair looked, or if they've got a scar or anything else. If you see something where a person is looking at someone else, there's no guarantee that other person is even on set. Chase Masterson and I were never in the same place. Her lines were filmed weeks and weeks after mine were, and a person on set read her lines, and in fact, she hadn't even been cast at the time. There are scenes where I'm in the car while it's moving. Well, the car is not moving. It's sitting inside of a garage. There's a light fixture nearby with a sort of windmill next to it that is causing it to look like I'm passing shadows, and the effect is pretty cool, but the car is not moving. The whole thing was being handled by an excellent production company, people who are really good professionals, who had done all sorts of shooting, and this was a chance for them to do a certain kind of feature film. And Johannes had written the script along with a couple collaborators, but they were contributing a whole bunch of expertise as well. There were people on set doing lights and sound and camera. There was craft services, people who were providing food. There were people who were providing hydration by walking around with water and Red Bull and all sorts of fruit drinks, depending on what we wanted. When it came to costumes and makeup, there were people whose job were to keep continuity and profile and make sure that we were doing what we were doing two shots ago. In other words, a team working in lockstep to make this movie look like it had been shot in real time across a day. Whenever they have to move the cameras and the lights to get another shot, that's called a setup. That means that there's going to be a whole bunch of planning and arguing about the angle and how they're going to do it, and then the actors wait around while this happens, and then eventually, eventually, there'll be some shooting. This is something I wish more people knew. It is possible to wait for hours, hours, before you do a 30-second shot. There might be a conversation that you have with somebody, and you're supposed to be very angry at them, and you're supposed to look over the table and shout at them and point at them. And you might wait for two, three, four, or five hours while everything around you is being arranged, and eventually you're called, and you have to be accessible so you might be on some sort of nearby trailer or some lawn chairs or in a hotel nearby, but you'll be called in by the staff and you will have been waiting for hours for this chance. So if you're a normal person, if you are waiting for your one moment to go on, you are going to put all of your energy in it. This is what you've been waiting for all day. This came into sharp focus with me and a woman who was playing a policeman where my hand had to go out with a passport, and my hand hit her in the face. And after I apologized profusely after they shouted cut, she said, no, we got to keep doing that. That's hilarious. So I hit her harder the next time. In fact, it's often a case that the director has to keep things from becoming slapstick because the actors have been getting punchier and punchier waiting for their moment. The first day of shooting, which happened just an hour or two after I landed in the airport, had no lines. My character was in the scene, but I wasn't speaking. Later shots had me sitting around or interacting with Johannes, and then a couple days went by, and then I would do a scene where I did a whole bunch of talking that took place before the other scenes completely out of chronological order. When it comes to lines, I'm not the person with the greatest memory, but they did a pretty good job of working around that, of filming me and having me hear them say the beginning prompt of the next line, and then I would go off on what I was supposed to say. Sometimes I got the lines wrong. Sometimes I got them right. We just did takes until we got it right. My character was meant to be boisterous, vicious, have a hint of menace, and I tried to focus on that. On one of the days I wasn't acting, they were going to shoot in Czech at this very strange tourist attraction and do some shooting in the parking lot. 
and since I'd never been to the country, this seemed like something I could not avoid. I ended up traveling for well over an hour and a half with the crew as we went to this parking lot of this business, and it's impossible to describe how weird this place was. It's on the border between Czech and Austria. It has a casino. It has a shopping mall, duty-free shops, and it has a full plane sitting in one part of the parking lot that's a restaurant. It is, in other words, a classic tourist destination. In the parking lot, people were dressed up in different characters and running around, and as it turned out, one of the interactions had to be with my character, so we just had me read my lines, and that's the rare time that I actually met another actor I was interacting with. Most of what I did was just walk around, go through all the shops, try not to be seen in the back of other shots, and just enjoyed watching the process. And here's the thing. I'm so used to directing, and when you're in that position, your mind is in a dozen different places. You are trying to make sure the shot looks good. You're trying to think about the pacing, about the answers, about going on to the next bit of the shot and making sure everything's in order. But when you're an actor, the thought process is completely different. You're thinking about being somebody else. You're thinking about being a character. You're trying to get your lines right, look in the right place, and interact. But you don't have to worry about whether or not the light is right or whether there's something in the background. Your job is to be that person or character over and over in a way that the editor later has something decent to work with and they can make things flow. Being an angry gangster who's yelling at a self-driving car, that was fun. This was a well-oiled machine. I never saw anything that would have concerned me about skill or that what was going to come out the other side would be anything other than a fun romp and a well-put-together story. When we hit that last day of shooting and I read the last of my lines, did the last of my poses, and then went back to the production house to take a few publicity photos, I was just so pleased to have said yes to Johannes's offer in that restaurant after that hacker con. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Adam Green, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been helping me get out of debt. So this movie has been edited. I know that. And I know they're going to have a premiere in the next month or two. I have no idea what it's going to be like. And this is probably the best lesson I could explain to people when they see things about movies and actors and in the movie an actor is a certain way and then they ask him questions or ask her why she made this choice and they always say, I don't know, because it turns out that you actually have very little control over the movie's flow regardless of the words you think you've said and the character you thought you were playing. There is a wonderful YouTube video talking about how Star Wars was saved in the edit, and it shows all the traced shots they used and then realigned them, including lines and scenes and poses, to give a whole different feel to the movie when they radically changed its flow. There was about three movies filmed for Star Wars, and they used one movie's worth. And it was the work of an amazing editor, Marsha Lucas, George Lucas's wife, who actually made a film out of what was an overshot mess. In the same way, I'll walk into that film, and I have to stress this, there were weeks of shooting this film. There's a whole bunch of characters, people I never met, folks who are going to interact with my character or add to scenes and plots that I'll have never seen, and whatever comes out the other end, I'm not going to have any idea. I'll be seeing it the first time as everyone else. There's historical records of various actors showing up to films and discovering that none of their stuff got into the movie, or finding out that what they thought their character was has been completely changed, or replaced, or fixed up in a way that somebody else is doing the voice. This is all stuff that can happen when you're putting together a feature film. 
you put your energy in, you give the best performance you can, and based on a whole bunch of factors that you have no control over, something else is going to come out the other end.